Hello, and welcome to Crad COVID Readings. I'm Keith Aria de Candido, reading my writing to provide you with loads and loads of entertainment. Uh, we're concluding the week of Precinct Stories, stories set in the world of Dragon Precinct, with Blood in the Water, which is, uh, like Wednesday's Heroes Welcome, a story I wrote specifically for the Tales from Dragon Precinct short story collection, which came out in 2013 originally. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with the original stories I wrote for this collection was focus on some of the secondary detectives. Uh, while uh, Danthrus Tresillian and Torian Van Wivelt are the main characters, uh, there are two sets of, of supporting detectives. Uh, at least uh, for the first, and for the first several novels, it was Ian and Grovis who were the focus of Catch and Release, which I read earlier in the series, and Drew and Hawk who were the focus of Blood in the Water. Drew and Hawk is actually a, a running gag of mine. Um, two of my oldest friends are John Stephen Drew and Arenthal Vance Hawkins. Um, uh, I've known John since uh, our days at Cardinal Spelman High School together here in New York City, and I've known Arenthal since our days at Fordham University, also here in the Bronx. We're all from the Bronx. And, although, neither of them lives in the Bronx anymore. They live in other places. I still live in the Bronx. Whatever. But we all originally were from here, and uh, we went to uh, school together. And we did things like the Chronic Rift public access show in the 90s, uh, and also uh, all three of us were involved in the revival of Sane in 2008 as a podcast. And um, I've included characters named Drew and Hawkins or in various works of mine over the years. Uh, most notably in the Starfleet Corps of Engineers series, there were two security guards on the USS Da Vinci named Stephen Drew and Vance Hawkins. Um, and there was Drew and Hawk in the Precinct series as well. Um, this... Uh, story focuses on the two of them. This was actually a challenge I put to myself when I wrote Goblin Precinct. I mentioned the Corvin case without any idea of what it was. Uh, and then I sat down to write it uh, when I was writing the stories for Tales from Dragon Precinct. So this takes place between Unicorn Precinct and Goblin Precinct, uh, as well as some flashbacks to earlier uh, in, in uh, Hawk's career. So without further ado, here is Blood in the Water. There was a time when Lieutenant Drew woke up at the same time as his wife. He wasn't sure when it had stopped being the case, but the fact that he no longer did so made him both happy and sad. The latter, because it used to be that he couldn't sleep without Zan curled up next to him, and now it seemed he could. The former, because Zan got up an hour before sunup every day. He understood why, of course. While Drew toiled for the Cliff's End Castle Guard, Zan used the basement of their house as a haven for small children who needed to be taken care of during the day, and she needed to get up that early to get everything prepared. In particular, she had to be ready for the twin infants whose parents and older sister had been on Saptor Isle since the spring. It paid well, and it fulfilled the maternal urges that Zan had had since she was a little girl helping her mother raise her siblings. Handy, since Zan, as it turned out, was barren a pronouncement from the healer that would have turned a weaker soul into a quivering mess. And indeed, it did do that for Drew, who had always wanted children and was devastated by the news. Zan, however, found another way to care for children. If it couldn't be her own, it'd be other people's. When the time chimes rang six times, Drew clambered out of the half-empty bed. His shift started at seven, and he only needed an hour to get ready and walk to the castle. Their house was located on Tyron's Way in Dragon Precinct, the middle-class district of Cliff's End, but close to Unicorn Precinct, the upper-class district where about half of Zan's clients lived. Can you do me a favor? Zan asked as he got up. Dryly, Drew said, Good morning, sweetness. How are you this morning? She rolled her eyes. I'm fine, love. Look, I need a favor. I got a message this morning that Carrie's sick, so she won't be able to go down to the docks for me. Why do you need Carrie to go down to the docks? Drew asked incredulously. Carrie was a young girl who helped Zan out most days. That's a really a shit place for a little girl to go. Please watch your language, Drew. This time Drew rolled his eyes. You didn't answer my question. You know the twins, Elva and Lon? Drew nodded. The ones with family on Saptor. Yes, them. Uh, the family in question is due back today on the Bella's Bones. They sent a message that they wanted someone to meet them at the docks when they arrived. I was going to have Carrie do it, but, but she's sick. Drew walked up to Zan and put a hand on her shoulder. I can do it. Are you sure? I don't want Osric yelling at you again. Chuckling, Drew said, the captain will yell at me no matter what. Nah, it'll be okay. Me and Hawk are next up, so we get the next case. If we do, we'll be wandering all over the city-state, and I can sneak off at noon to the docks. If we don't, 
we'll be sitting on our asses all day and I can go out to meet the boat at midday. Either way, Hawk will cover for me. Zan breathed a sigh of relief. You know I wouldn't ask, but they are clients. And honestly, they paid more than I quoted them. And the twins have just been darlings. I don't want to let them down. Don't worry about it, sweetness. He kissed the top of her head. I gotta get to work. She looked up at him with her almond eyes and almost smiled. Thank you, love. One of these days, Drew thought with a sigh as he climbed into his leather armor, she was going to smile at him again. He was sure of it. He ambled slowly up Mirka Way through Unicorn Precinct, the early morning sun dattling through the trees that lined the street, which also served to conceal the mansions from the riffraff that passed along Cliff's End's main thoroughfare. When he arrived about ten minutes before the shift started, his first stop was, as always, the pantry. He didn't even bother to take his cloak off first. Jonas's wife made the best pastries, and for some reason he was particularly hungry for them. Maybe because Zan had recently stopped making breakfast for him, busy as she was with getting the house ready for the day's infestation of children. His partner, Lieutenant Hawk, was already there, his dreadlocks hanging over his cloak, which he also hadn't bothered to remove upon entry. What's the matter? He asked with his mouth full. Drew shrugged. Just, eh, nothing, really. Same shit, you know? Danthris, Grovis, and Ian each arrived in turn, and Jonas provided some quick updates on things including confirmation that Drew and Hawk were back in the rotation. Frowning, Danther said, Wait, those idiots from Mermaid were your guys? Hawk nodded. Yeah, we talked them down in Mermaid's Hole yesterday. Talked to them down in Mermaid's Hole yesterday, and they came right out and said they hit Felspans, too. Grinning, Drew added, Maybe next time they'll know better than to hit a fish place when three guards from Mermaid are having lunch there. So now we got them on two robberies, and the Felspans case is finally closed. I'm really hoping nobody commits no crimes today, Hawk said with a sigh. Me too. Uh, listen, Hawk, can you do me a favor and cover for me around noon? I need to run an errand for Zan at the docks. Hawk looked annoyed right up until he mentioned his wife. Oh, yeah, okay, if it's something for Zan, sure. So what, you weren't gonna just do it when it was a favor for me? Your wife, I like. Your wife, she didn't crap out on me when I needed someone to help me with Dad. Drew put his head in his hands. You don't need any help with your father. Your father ain't crippled, and he ain't... Excuse me! Turning, Drew saw a young girl with a rat's nest of blonde curls and a pointed nose. She was one of the youth squad, children who performed errands for the castle guard, usually carrying messages. Sergeant Man had said to find some detectives. Says there's a boat floating out in the Garamond that's supposed to be docking, but it ain't moving. Sent a dinghy out, and ain't nobody alive on a boat. They're towing it in now, but the Sarge figures they'll need detectives. Jonas nodded and looked at Drew and Hawk. You two are up, so I guess this is yours. He smiled. This will make it easy for you to run your errand, huh, Drew? Guess so. Drew turned to the girl as he fished a copper out of his money pouch. Which boat is it? Bella's Bones. Drew dropped the copper piece on the floor. Shit. By the time Drew and Hawk made it down to the docks, Bella's Bones, bones had been towed in by the dinghy that Mermaid Precinct had sent out. They were met there by an elderly guard in a green cloak emblazoned with a mermaid medallion that matched the one on his leather armor. Shaking his head as they approached, Drew said, I still can't believe Osric got your sorry ass back in leather. Manet utter uttered a croaking laugh. Well, retirement wasn't really engaging me all that much. Besides, who else was going to take this shit job? Mermaid Precinct had been rocked by scandal, exposed by Ian and Grovis just before midsummer, with Sergeant Gaffney forced to resign. Manet was a guard life, castle guard lifer who had hit his 25-year mark and retired. Osric had talked him out of retirement in order to run Mermaid. Anybody but you. Drew had come up with Manet as his training officer in Dragon Precinct. Weren't you the one who told me never to let him promote you because being a guard was the only good job in town? Yeah, and we both didn't listen. Manet pointed at the boat, which two of Mermaid's guards were mooring. There's your crime scene. Drew nodded, Hawk following him. Hawk was an expert sailor, having spent much of his youth on the water with his boat captain grandfather, so he went up first, hopping onto the boat's deck with the ease of long practice. Drew, who tended to throw up when on a ship at sea, climbed in a bit more gingerly. Expecting Hawk to move about the deck, Drew was surprised to settle onto the deck and find his partner not having moved. What's going? Then he saw it. The deck was stained with blood, and there were corpses everywhere. Some were obviously sailors, others well-dressed passengers. Most of them had their necks ripped open, and the few that didn't had wounds in their upper thighs. 
glancing about, Drew saw no other obvious wounds. He also saw surprisingly little blood, given how many wounds there were. Or, rather, not surprising at all, given that they were neck and thigh wounds. Shit, he said. We've got us a new nest of vampires. I thought all the vampires were wiped out five years ago. Captain Osric sat behind the desk at his office, sharpening his dagger. Yeah, me too, Hawk said from one of the guest chairs across from him. In fact, I knew me a vamp hunter who retired after the Brotherhood made that their pronouncement about wiping vamps out. I have to admit, Osric said, I was dubious about that pronouncement, but we also haven't had a single vamp attack in those five years. Should have known better. Pity I can't berate Bonin on the subject. The castle guard's magical examiner, a wizard on loan from the Brotherhood of Wizards to aid in investigations, was away at a conference, along with the local Brotherhood representative, Gunderson. Not that Bonin would be of much use here. Vampires disrupted magic, so his peel back to ascertain what happened on Bella's bones would be useless. Then again, Drew thought as he sat in the seat next to Hawks, they hardly needed a spell to tell them that vampires killed those people. Vamps were the only creatures who feasted on blood like that, and neck and upper thigh wounds were the ones that bled the most profusely. Is this vampire hunter in Cliff's End? Osric asked Hawk. He nodded. Last I heard, he was living in the place over Min Minar's. Good. Go find him. We'll need all the help we can get on this. Oh, he'll be helping. Corvin's got himself a serious mad on for vamps. Hawk got to his feet. You coming, partner? Hmm? Drew looked up. Uh, sorry. Was just thinking about how I'm going to have to tell Zan that the twins' parents and sister are dead. I don't know what we're going to do with them. Hawk was starting to get worried about his partner. Drew had been unusually quiet down the entire walk down Mirka Way into Dragon Precinct. When they turned onto Auburn Way, Hawk finally asked him, What's wrong? I told you back at the captain's office. Drew shook his head. Bad enough we gotta deal with these kids during the day. And these twins? An aunt's supposed to take them at night, but half the time she, didn't even, she don't even show and we're stuck with them overnight. Well, maybe the aunt will take them permanent now. Before Drew could answer, Minar came lumbering out of the shop's front door. Oh, Lieutenant, uh, glad you're here. He pointed above his shop, toward the apartment there with one massive arm. There uh, might be something up with Corbin. Heard all kinds of nasty-ass noises up there early out last evening. That ain't good, Hawk said. Drew asked, you checked on him? Minar shook his head. Nah, the noise stopped after a while, and then I had a shit ton of customers to deal with, so I didn't get the chance to check. But I ain't seen him come down from here. He usually stops by on his way in to breakfast in the morning. Where does he have breakfast? Drew asked. Hawk answered before Minor could. The dog and duck, yeah? He always has that, that he always has that nasty stew for breakfast. Minor nodded his large head. Yeah, he's still going there every morning, but I ain't seen him today. We'll check it out, Drew said, and Hawk followed his partner around to the side door that led to the staircase up to the flat. When they got to the top, Hawk knocked on the door and started to say it's Hawk from the Castle Guard. Open up. But he only got as far as it's when the first knock pushed the door open with a slow creak. Hawk put his hand to his sword hilt as he pushed the door open the rest of the way. Corvin? He called out as he walked into the disaster area of an apartment. It was only one room, but it was a mess. All the furniture was overturned and or damaged. One of the windows, looking out to the rear of the building, was cracked and the floor was littered with jagged edge pieces of wood, glass, and ceramic. The two detectives slowly moved through the apartment, which didn't take long. Hawk saw no bodies and very little blood. He looked at his partner. This is the worst kind of bad. Drew threw up his hands. Who is this guy, anyhow? The best damn vamp, hu vamp hunter in Flingaria, that's who he is. We got the same lack of blood we had on the boat. Well, that, just could, that could just mean he wasn't here and the drops we are seeing are from the guy who trashed the place. Or a vamp god. Hawk shrugged. Bound to be happening eventually, especially since he ain't fought one in five years. Something's wrong, though, Drew said, looking around the place. What is? A couple things. For starters, Minar said he didn't see Corbin leave, so where is he? Hawk hadn't thought of that. Maybe he snuck out to the dog and duck without Minar noticing. It's worth asking. What's the other thing? Hawk asked as they headed out of the apartment. Shaking his head, Drew said, Not sure. Something feels wrong about that place, beyond the obvious, I mean. They went back outside and looked around before finding a member of the youth squad. Drew talked to her while Hawk went to Minar. We're going to be getting a guard from Dragon to keep an eye on things. 
Don't be letting anybody up into Corbin's place. And if you see someone trying, call a guard. Absolutely, Minar said with a nod. Hawk walked back to Drew, who dropped a copper in the youth squatter's hands. Hey, that's two of the little brats I tipped today. You either get the next two or you buy lunch. Yeah, yeah. Hawk considering pointing, considered pointing out that Drew and his wife both made money while Hawk was single and had to take care of Dad, but he didn't feel like having that argument again. As they walked back down Auburn toward Mirka Way, Drew asked, So why is this Corbin guy such hot shit? I mean, if I remember right, the whole thing about vampires is that they prefer to come out at night, they mess up magic, they drink blood, they're strong and fast, and the only way to kill them is by beheading. Right, but Corvin? He bagged himself hundreds of vamps. When they had that infestation of him in Barlin after the, back after the war, he's the one that cleaned the town up. Him and Gan Brightblade, they killed those vamps that had taken over Saptor Isle. And I heard that he saved King Marcus's own damn cell from a vamp in Valesa. Drew snorted. If he saved the king's life and was a friend of Brightblade's, why is he living on that shithole over Minar's? Because I ain't told you the other part yet. Reason I know Corvin is because we had us a vamp murder in Mermaid back in the day. Just like this one. Boat floating out in the garamond, we towed it in, and there was nothing but dead bodies and not nearly enough blood for all the blood, neck and thigh wounds. Then we got two more just like it, and I kept noticing that one guy was always being there. Six years earlier, Hawk stood on the docks and approached Lieutenant Linder. Excuse me, Lieutenant, but I've been noticing something. Linder had just finished talking to the dockmaster. What's that, Hawk? That man over there. He's been lurking at each of the seeds. So have half a dozen sailors. Don't worry about it. Hawk had more to say, but Linder wandered off. And damn it, there was something off about that guy. He wasn't just watching like all the other sailors and dock rats and such who just wanted to see a pile of dead bodies. This guy was observing. When he'd been on duty, when he'd been on duty when Lieutenants Ben Wivold and Tresillian were on a case, he'd noticed that they observed like that. But Linder and his partner, Ian, they weren't like that. Hawk needed to find out who that guy was. So he went over to him, except all of a sudden he was gone. He searched the docks up and down and couldn't find him. The next day there was another murder, just a single dead body with a neck wound in the dancing seagull, except this one had blood pooling around the body. Hawk and another guard from Mermaid, Gaffney, were on the scene, and Gaffney said, We better get the cloaks down here. Looks like another vamp. But Hawk was noticing the guy from the dock sitting in a booth. Walking over to him, Hawk said, I need to be talking to you. Your partner is a fool. That person was not murdered by a vampire. Hawk nodded. Too much blood, yeah, I figured. But the last time I was disagreeing with Gaffney, he yelled at me and did what he wanted anyhow. So now I just let him go and let someone else yell at him. The man sipped his drink. You are wise. You've been at all the vamp murders. You know something. you got to be telling us so we can stop this. Believe me, you cannot stop this. These are remnants from the vampires I assisted in exterminating on Saptor. I beheaded one last night. I have tracked the other one. So what are you doing here? Hawk asked accusingly. When I heard about the cutthroat, I believed it might be the vampire I thought, sought. It's not, which I should have known. Vampires are creatures of habit, and this one has never been one to kill but once, nor kill in a tavern. However, you and that other guard will not permit anyone to depart, so I have remained. I prefer not to have issue with the castle guard. You're going to be having a lot more issue if you don't be talking to lieutenants when they get here. If you know who did this... The man set his drink down and grabbed Hawk's wrist in a tight grip. You are not equipped. Ow! Hey, let go of me! He acquiesced, letting go. The castle guard cannot deal with this. My name is Corvin. Vampires killed my wife and my children. And since that horrible day, I have dedicated my life to hunting down these monsters and destroying them. Yeah, well, the Castle Guard's job is to hunt down folks that kill other folks, and we've gotten pr pretty good at it. And folks who stop us from doing that get themselves arrested, which is what we'll be doing to you if you don't talk to the lieutenants when they get here. Corbin took a sip of his drink and said, What if I deliver the decapitated corpse of the guilty party to you? Like I said, if you talk to the lieutenants... No, not the lieutenants. You. For the first time, Corbin came close to almost smiling. You notice my presence at the other scenes. I have what some call a gift for not being noticed. I even snuck up on my good friend Gan Brightblade once. Hawk was impressed. The legendary hero was known for being impossible to catch unawares. But you observe me, which is a rare gift. Meet me underneath the old port in an hour before sunset. At an hour, excuse me, before sunset. 
The door to the dancing seagull opened then, and Hawk turned to see Linder and Ian walking in. Gaffney told them they had a dead body and led them to it. Lord and Lady Gaffney, Linder said. What kind of shit brain are you, anyhow? Excuse me? Gaffney sounded indignant. We're looking for a vampire. You know, big scary monster that drinks blood. If a vampire killed this poor bastard, there wouldn't be any blood around because the vampire would have drunk it all. Because that's what vampires do. Now, since you're too stupid to do your job right, me and Ian will walk all the way back to the castle and send two other lieutenants who don't actually have a case to solve this murder. Shaking his head, Linder left, Ian following. Hawk turned back to ask Corbin more questions, but he was gone. Wait a minute, Drew said as they approached the dog and duck. You mean the informant that you said helped you find that vampire was this Corbin guy? Hawk nodded. Drew shook his head. He'd heard this story plenty of times before, from Hawk and from others who served with him at Mermaid at the time, since it was his finding that vampire that led to Hawk being promoted when Lieutenant Nail died. Believable. Why didn't you say who it was? He was asking me not to. Besides, you know how what he did when I met up with him at the old port. He took out this huge, curved sword. Ain't seen nothing like it before or since. He cut right through the planks with it, exposed the vamp, and cut its head off with one Slice. Drew's eyes widened. Seriously? He'd never seen a sword that could behead someone cleanly. Hell, most axes couldn't even get it done that neatly. They walked into the dog and duck. The proprietor, Olaf, came waddling out from behind the inn's front desk, the light from the window reflecting off his bald pate. Hello to you, lieutenants. Uh, what can Olaf be doing for you this fine day? Rolling his eyes at Olaf's broken common, he'd moved to Cliff's End from the islands to the east almost two decades ago now and he didn't need to affect the silly accent. Drew said, We're wondering if uh, Corbin came by for his breakfast this morning. Funny is that you should be asking this. On the yesterday, Corbin, he comes, in for, he comes for to break his fast, but to go is how he takes it, as he cannot stay to eat. That unusual? Drew asked. Very yes, unusual yes. Always in the end does he eat. But he says he has appointment with Swordmaster, and today he does not come at all. Did he say which swordmaster? Olaf shook his bald head, but Hawk answered the question. I'm knowing which swordmaster. Come on. Stay, will you not, Lieutenant, and have a drink? Perhaps some stew we are having the extra today. We need to be finding Corbin, Hawk said, grabbing Drew's arm and practically dragging him out of the inn. As they went out the front door, Drew said, You know, it's getting to be lunchtime, and you still owe me a meal. Later, we need to be finding Corbin. We find him, we'll find the killer. Why are you so sure? This guy isn't even a lead on the case. He's... Hawk stopped in the middle of the street and turned to stare at Drew. Only swordmaster he used was Milano. She's the only one can handle that curved blade of his. And if he went to her yesterday, it means he's resharpening the sword, which means he knows there's a vamp in town. We gotta be finding him and his sword. Drew wasn't entirely sure his partner was right, but Hawk knew this Corbin guy, and while he may not have been a real lead, they didn't have any actual leads, so it couldn't hurt to play this one out. They walked over to Alfar's way. Drew's stomach was growling now, and he really wished that they'd taken Olaf up on his offer of food. Drew had met Milano once or twice before. He remembered being surprised that she was an elf, given that her name was human, but she claimed to have been raised by humans. She was as tall and ethereal, though her hair was darker than most elves. Currently, it was tied back into a ponytail as she was polishing a short sword while sitting in a big easy chair on the side of her small shop, the walls of which were lined with swords. No other weapons were on display. Milano was a specialist. She bounded up from her seated position, then gently set the sword and polishing rag down on the table next to the chair. Hello, Lieutenant Drew, Lieutenant Hawk. Been a few years. Please tell me the Castle Guard is finally upgrading its weaponry. Chuckling, Drew said, that's way over our pay grade. Damn. Milano shook her head, her ponytail waving back and forth. I'll have to talk to Sir Robert when he comes in to get his saber cleaned. Hawk winced. Sir Ramit owns a, uses a saber? Sir Ramit owns a saber. I wouldn't bet any coin on his ever having used it. She let out a very musical laugh and then asked, So, if you're not here to enact the upgrade that I've been begging for, seriously, those long swords you use? Pitiful. To be fair, Hawk said, we don't hardly ever use them. I ain't remembering the last time I took it out for anything except to clean it. Yeah, me either, Drew added. Well, in any event, how may I help you gentlemen today? Drew nodded. Uh, we heard tell that Corvin brought his sword in to be serviced yesterday? He did. Milano practically bounded over to the far wall. 
The woman was bursting with energy, but she still was gentle as she gingerly removed a curved blade that was at once thin and thick. She held it almost reverently. Well, he was supposed to pick it up this morning. He ain't come to get it yet? Hawk sounded almost panicked. If he doesn't, I can find a thousand buyers for this, including me. The craft of this blade is like nothing I've ever seen before that wasn't magic. It's three layers of metal fused together. It's incredibly sharp, too. This thing could probably cut down an entire stone building and only dull a little bit. Something's wrong, Hawk said. He wouldn't be leaving this unless something happened. We gotta be getting back to his place. Hawk practically ran out of Milano's. After shooting an apologetic look at the Swordmaster, Drew chased him, wondering if he was ever going to eat today. Hawk tore through the mess of Corbin's apartment, trying to find something that would give him a hint. As he tossed aside a chair to see if there was anything under it, there wasn't, aside from some shards of glass, he muttered, I'm really wishing Bonin was back from his damn conference so we could get us a peel back. Wouldn't matter, remember? Drew said from across the room, going through some scrolls that had been dumped on the floor. Vampires mess up the spell. I know, but... In frustration, Hawk threw a broken piece of pottery against the wall. Drew watched as it hit the far wall, and then finally, he figured out what had been bothering him since they first got here earlier. That wall. No way that's a far wall of a building. I've been in Minars a dozens of times. Yeah, and this is being the same size as his shop, Hawk said, not clear as to what his partner was getting at. Pointing at the far wall, Drew said, Yeah, the shop. But what about the storage room in the back? That's got to be another dozen hand lengths or so. Hallway and staircase are on this side, so what's over there? Frowning, Hawk looked around the room and realized that his partner was right. This flat should have been larger. Without another word, they started searching the far wall for some kind of hidden doorway, but found nothing. Maybe we should be trying the skeleton key? Hawk asked, but Drew shook his head. That only works on regular locked doors, not magic to walls. We need Benin. Yeah, well, we ain't got him. Then suddenly Hawk remembered something, snapping his fingers. Wait, remember the Jansen case from, like, three years ago? Drew frowned. Then he cried. Yeah, the guy who had uh, bodies hidden in his wall. Right, and he was having some kind of charm to open the wall so as he could be putting more bodies in. And Benin confiscated it. We need another one of those charms. Minor probably has one downstairs. Hawk shook his head emphatically, his dreadlock shaking with gesture. And who's going to be paying for that? That brought Drew up short, and Hawk could see that his partner had come to the same realization as he had. Charms of that sort weren't cheap, and the paperwork to requisition the funds to pay for such out of the guard's budget was a nightmare. Okay, Drew said. So we get the charm from the Jansen case. It's got to be in Benin's lair, right? Hawk let out a sigh. Ugh, yeah, it probably is. By the time they got back to Corbin's place, Drew was shuddering. I swear to Mitre, Zinf, Wyatt, Tamisa, Gandura, and whatever other god you care to name that I'm going to have nightmares tonight. It's going to be that damn Griffin's voice coming out of that damn Sprite's body and she's going to torture me all night. Hawk chuckled, which earned him a fierce gaze from his partner. Entering Benin's laboratory in the basement of the castle was problematic at the best of times, as the door was guarded by a magical Griffin with a screechy voice. But with Benin away at that Brotherhood Wizards conference, he left a Sprite behind to keep an eye on things. She led, the, led them to the charm eventually, but it took a lot of explaining before she got around to it and kept asking over and over again if they'd be returning it when they were done. As long as we're returning it when we're done, Hawk said, we'll be okay. I don't want to be thinking about what happens if we don't. Let's get this over with, Drew said, and pointed the charm at the wall. Moments later, the wall faded away, revealing another section of the apartment, except this space was filled with an elaborate bench. There were levered bars at ankle and wrist level, which had shackles on the end of them. This meant whoever was on the bench could be compressed or stretched out via his or her limbs. The bench itself was stained with blood, as well as something purple, though all of it was long since dried. Littered all over the floor were containers with the logo of Cardi's Butcher Shop. Looking closely at the bench, Drew pointed at the shackles. These have been busted open. What the hell was he doing back here? Reliving the days of Chalmrake the Foul? Drew shook his head slowly. That wizard had menaced Flingaria in the past, and he was said to have tortured his prisoners. This device that Corbin had been hiding behind a magic wall just had to be an instrument of torture. Bending over, Drew picked up one of the butcher shop's containers. I know this place. It's on the Riverwalk. Let's go see what they have to say. Yeah. 
Drew didn't like the sound of his partner's voice. What's wrong, Hawk? Let's just be going. Hawk exited the apartment. Following him, Drew said, Damn it, what's the matter? Ain't none of this making any sense, Hawk said. He and Drew both nodded to Manfred, the guard from Dragon Precinct who was keeping an eye on the place. They continued out toward Mirka Way, which would take them to the Riverwalk, that being the border between Goblin and Mermaid Precincts. Look, we're doing what we always do. We follow the leads. Yeah, but they ain't making any sense. Hawk let out a long breath. You said that already, but... Stopping short, Hawk looked at Drew. He was saving my life, okay? Drew frowned. What? When we was meeting up at the old port, Corvin cut down some of the old planks so we could get at where the vamp was hiding, but I barged right on him, and the damn thing jumped me. I was trying to take my sword out, but it was all over me. And then Corvin, he impaled the bastard on his curved blade, and I was able to get away. If he'd acted just a little slower, I'd have been the vamp's last meal. Drew had expected Corvin to look more impressive. When they arrived at the old port, Hawk led them straight to the spot under the rotted planks of Cliff's End's original dock. The location was a more natural port than the current dock ones, which were constructed after Cliff's End grew too large for the original spot to be practical. The old port had fallen into disrepair. Pushing aside a pile of pitted wood, Hawk revealed a small, dark, humid cubbyhole. Drew had to admit, he hadn't been sure what they would find here. He wasn't even sure why he went along with Hawk's crazy notion to come here after they talked to the butcher. But then they found Corvin, tied to two of the planks with a thick rope. At least Drew assumed it was Corvin, mostly based on Hawk calling him by that name when they entered. His neck was smeared with blood, his clothes filthy and torn, and he seemed unusually pale. Hawk, Corvin said weakly. In, in Mitre's name, I, I never expected to to see you or, or anyone ever again. P -p Please, you, you must release me from these bonds. As Hawk unsheathed his sword in order to slice open the ropes, Drew asked, when's the vampire due back, you think? Ex excuse me? Don't be playing dumb, Hawk said as he cut one rope. Corvin then moved to untie the other knot himself. I, I, I am not playing anything, lieutenants, but I... Drew interrupted. You had a vamp shackled to your little torture device. The one you hit behind the wall? You kept him there for what, six years? I'm guessing he's the one you told me you decapitated back at the Dance of the Seagull. Except you didn't cut his head off. You captured him so you could torture him. You fed him just enough blood to keep him alive. You had a butcher and goblin give you animal blood. And before you try to deny it, the butcher already confirmed it. Corvin rubbed his wrists, the skin of which was raw from his bonds. You are very clever. Yes, I... It did capture one of those those monsters. The sp spell I purchased to hide it from sight of apparently also protected from the spell that the Brotherhood of Wizards c cast six years ago to wipe out all living vam vampires. He took a deep breath and swallowed. They are f foul creatures of the magic. They kill without mercy or remorse or reason. Actually, that's a funny thing, Drew said. They do kill for a reason, to feed. Except he didn't feed off you. He brought you here instead. Not too surprising, Hawk said. Like you was saying to me back in the day, vamps is creatures a habit. This is where they were holed up last time, when they was killing folks on boats. When your prisoner got loose, he trashed your place and started doing the same thing over again. Even brought your sorry ass to the same place he holed up then. But why? Drew asked. Corvin's hands balled into fists. You interrogate me as if I were one of your prisoners. Our prisoners are criminals, Drew said. Of course, torture is a crime. So is harboring a fugitive, and so is letting a murder suspect run loose. Torture of people is a crime, Lieutenant, Corbin snapped. Drew noticed that he ignored the other parts. That, that foul thing does not have the rights, the same rights as you or I, any more than a dog does. The dog wouldn't go to the trouble of bringing you here, though. Drew stepped forward. Corbin was half a head taller than Drew. Indeed, he was taller than Torrent, who towered over everyone in the squad room and his breath smelled like something had died in his mouth, but Drew didn't care. If they were right, and it was looking increasingly like they were, the only reason the vampire got loose to kill the people on Bella's bones was because this guy let it loose. So why'd he let you live? A papery voice sounded from behind Drew. Revenge! Whirling around, Drew put his hand to his sword hilt. Standing in a corner of the cubbyhole beneath the erstwhile dock was a pale, hairless creature with watery yellow eyes, 
and a dry-lipped mouth filled with sharp teeth. The vampire was hunched over, holding bent, tailed hands in front of its body. The vampire continued to speak, though the words sounded odd coming from a mouth filled with such long, sharp teeth. To kill is not enough. This monster must pay for what he did to me. I am the monster. Your kind killed my family. Hissing, the vampire said, <laughs> And you killed mine. Hawk then asked the question that was on Drew's mind. Since when do vamps be speaking? The night creatures have always spoken human, the vampire said with a sneer. But we never felt the need to learn your gutter tongue. However, listening to this monster for six years enabled me to speak as you do. Having to wrap my lips around your idiotic language is the final torture this creature has visited upon me. Corbin moved slowly forward. Then these words shall be your last. Then the vampire hissed and slashed at the air in front of him with his hands. Corbin backed off, perhaps suddenly remembering that he was unarmed, his best weapon still at Milano's. I'm sorry, friend. Drew said slowly, hand on sword hilt. But we're gonna have to arrest you in the name of the Lord and Lady for the murder of two dozen people on the Bella's bones. Tha! Do you arrest a dwarf who eats meat? A human who consumes a stew? You have a problem with it, Drew said. You can take it up with the magistrate. And then the vampire leapt and attacked him. Drew tried to pull his sword out, but the monster was too fast, leaping atop him and knocking him to the ground. The pair of them rolling on the rocky, uneven ground beneath the wood. Hawk immediately yanked his own sword out and went for the vampire, but he slashed at Hawk, his talons cutting through the leather armor right at the griffin medallion on his chest, drawing blood. The vampire was now kneeling on Drew's chest, snarling down at him, bearing the two rows of sharp teeth. He was suddenly very sorry that he left the house annoyed with Zan this morning, because he really wanted the last thing he would ever say to his wife to be that he loved her. Then Corbin took a jagged plank of wood and shoved it into the vampire's neck. A purple ichor spr spurted forth, and Drew suddenly realized that the purple stains on the bench in Corbin's apartment were the vampire version of blood. Screaming, the vampire, the plank still embedded in the side of his neck, jumped at Corbin, the two of them smashing through the wood and onto the rocky coast. Clambering to his feet, Drew limped out, unable to put his full weight on his right ankle, to see where the vampire's sharpened teeth but were biting fiercely into Corbin's neck, while the latter was trying to shove the hunk of wood deeper. Hawk stumbled out right behind him, right hand gripping his sword, left arm cradling his chest, trying to keep the blood from the scratches in. Both bodies went limp at roughly the same time. Drew glanced at Hawk, and the pair of them cautiously approached the vampire and the vampire hunter from two different sides. After a moment, though, it was obvious that they were both dead, having succeeded in killing each other. Quietly, Drew said, I guess they each got their revenge, huh? Hawk watched as the healer, having already dealt with Hawk's scratches, which turned out to be superficial, gave Drew a potion that would heal his ankle within a day. Also present were several guards from Mermaid Precinct, as well as Sergeant Manet, who had personally escorted Zan. She ran straight to Drew, sitting on one of the rocks near the old port. Oh, love, I thought you were dead. She practically fell on him with her embrace. It's just my ankle, sweetness. It was a vampire. When that guard came to the house, I'm fine. But I got bad news about the twins. She nodded quickly. I heard. I've already talked to their aunt, and she promises to take custody of them, but only on the condition that I continue to care for them during the day as I have been. Hawk shook his head as he walked over to the pair of them. Drew grimaced. And when she doesn't show up again, then we will deal with it. Yeah, but how are you doing, Hawk? Zan asked over Drew's objection, sounding genuinely concerned. I'm not being as lucky as my partner, he said with a small smile, because I ain't got me a great wife. She put a hand on his. It was warm and comforting. Someday you shall. She looked around. I'm surprised your father isn't around. Oh, he ain't getting around all that good on account of he's all crippled and... Drew rolled his eyes. Lord and Lady Hawk, your father is not crippled. He's just a lazy-ass shit brain. Before Hawk could reply, Zan said, You'll have to excuse my foul-mouthed husband, Hawk. The potion obviously made him delirious. Hawk just shook his head. Me, I'm wondering what was with Corbin. Thought he was glad to be rid of Vance. Instead, he kept hanging on to the hate, keeping that thing in his home for all these years. What happens when you get obsessed, I guess, suppose. Drew sighed. Me, I'm just glad this case is closed and the bastard's dead. Unable to believe his ears, Hawk whirled on his partner. He saved our lives, Drew. 
They only needed saving because of him. Yeah, but... Hawk trailed off after having nothing to say after that. Look, Zan said after only, why don't you come over to our house, Hawk? I'm making a nice dinner for the children, and you can join us and continue your argument over a meal. Drew smiled, a peace gesture. What do you say, partner? Now that we killed the big monster, we can deal with some tiny monsters. After a moment, Hawk returned the smile. Yeah, okay. But he wondered, as they walked away from the old port, which of the two beings who died today was the bigger monster. And that's the end of that. That's Tales from Dragon Precinct is available from Eastpec Books. Uh, the ebook is only 99 cents. Uh, Eastpec has having, been having a pandemic sale for the last few months. Uh, and you can also get the print book uh, from all the usual online dealers, Amazon, DNN.com, Kobo.com, iTunes, whatever. Uh, uh, check me out online at decantidote.net. Uh, there are links to order all the precinct books on that, si on that site, as well as links to all my social media and such. Um, my blog is at decantidote.wordpress.com. If you can support me at patreon.com slash crad, K-R-A-D, you can uh, check out vignettes of my work, of featuring my original characters, including a bunch of uh, Dragon Precinct ones. Uh, and please, please stay safe. Thanks for watching.